So I'm Anders. I work as a developer advocate for Styra. Uh, Styra is the inventors and the, and the main uh, maintainers of Open Policy Agent, which will be the topic of, of my presentation. So I have a long background in software development, uh, primarily in identity systems. Uh, and uh, for the last two, two and a half years, I was working in a, in a big project where we integrated OPA and uh, in, in, uh, in, an art, in, a, in a big microservice architecture. So that's kind of how I got involved in, in OPA in the first place. So I've, I've been on, on both sides, so to speak. Uh, when, I, when I don't work uh, with OPA, uh, my main passions include cooking, food, and football. And you'll find me on uh, Twitter and GitHub and so on. All right, so uh, what problem are we trying to solve here? Or what's the challenge? So the challenge is basically to manage policy in increasingly distributed, complex, and heterogeneous systems. So uh, just the modern application stack in any larger company normally con contains or entails this, all these uh, diverse and uh, different uh, languages, platforms, frameworks, and so on. And of course, we have uh, all these uh, targets for deployment, uh, our Kubernetes environment, Docker, containers, uh, Terraform, uh, and, and cloud resources, of course. Uh, so, and then there's, of course, data. So, any modern, like normally sized company is gonna have at least uh, probably half of these technologies. And, and the, more, the, more, the bigger the company, the more of these technologies. And the problem is that the, these technologies all have their way of working with policy. Uh, so that's the challenge. And the goal of OPA is to unify policy enforcement across this cloud native stack. So, so really what we're trying to do here is to, to have one way of speaking policy, regardless of uh, whether you're working with uh, Postgres, uh, AWS resources, or in Golang. So OPA is an open source general purpose policy engine. It offers a unified tool and a framework for working with policy across the stack. What OPA does, it decouples policy from application logic. So meaning it kind of extracts uh, the part that, that is policy and it moves that out. Kind of sort of like you'd move data from your app uh, and into your database. That's kind of what OPA does for policy. Uh, OPA is a policy decision engine though. It doesn't do uh, actual enforcement. So that's still up to you or your applications how they choose to act on these decisions. So normally that could be like maybe responding with a status code of 401 or 403 or, or maybe uh, sending a message to some Slack channel, but that's still up to your application. Uh, OPA is, is basically just giving you that decision. Uh, these policies, they're written in a language called Rego, which is a declarative language, which we'll look into uh, more in a bit. And since it is a general purpose policy engine, it's found uh, use cases in, uh, in everything from Kubernetes admission control, uh, app or microservice authorization, infrastructure policies, data source filtering or data source access, uh, and so on. So pretty much anywhere where you, can, where you can find policy, you can find OPA. And uh, OPA is a vibrant open source community. We we have I think these numbers are a little dated by now. So I think we have we're almost two hundred contributors, uh, fifty plus integrations listed, and yeah, it's it's a it's a big and and vibrant open source community. And uh, not only is there OPA like the core uh, policy engine, but there's also these kind of projects uh, surrounding OPA, such as ConfTest for, for uh, using uh, Rego and, and OPA on, on configuration files. And, and there's Gatekeeper for, uh, for using OPA as an admission controller. 
and there's uh, editor plugins and so on. But of course, it's it's not just a hobbyist uh, open source project. But OPA is used by uh, some of the biggest companies uh, in the world. And if that that's not enough to convince you, maybe this tweet will. The Open Policy Agent project is super dope. I finally have a framework that helps me translate written security policies into executable code for every layer of the stack. So that pretty much uh, that pretty much sums it all up. What OPA is about. Okay, so uh, Rego then, or OPA. How does it how does it work? How can OPA work with all these diverse uh, technologies? Uh, so the way the policy decision model works is kind of like this. There's normally a request coming in to your service. And when I say service, that could be anything. That could be your microservice, but it might as well be Kafka. It could be uh, the Linux PAM module, uh, or it could be Docker. It could be uh, the Kubernetes API server. So anything, uh, anything that kind of uh, intercepts or accepts requests uh, is kind of a viable target. So, so that's the, the model. And, and this service in turn turns to OPA to, to, for a decision basically. So it sends a policy query and this is all uh, HTTP, it's a REST API and it's like all just JSON. So any service or any, any technology which can talk HTTP and which can talk JSON is can can uh, ask OPA for a decision, and and of course pretty much any service the last twenty years or so can can do this. So that's why OPA can be uh, so pervasive. Uh, deployment then. Uh, the way it works, OPA is itself, it's, it's a, a tiny little uh, self-contained binary. So it's a single file and uh, it's lightweight. So ideally you deploy them everywhere. There's no like one big fat OPA uh, per server that every, everyone would talk to, but rather if you have uh, eight or nine pods serving your app, then you'd have eight or nine OPAs. You'd have one running inside of each pod. And the normal kind of deployment pattern is often uh, a sidecar in Kubernetes or it's a daemon running on the same host. And again, applications, they talk to OPA through the OPA REST API. But there are also a few other options available. If you have a Go app, you can you can talk to OPA or use OPA as a Go library. And there's also integrations for Envoy, Istio-based uh, service mesh meshes. And there's also uh, the option to compile your policy as uh, WebAssembly. Uh, what about Rego then? This policy language. It's a declarative high-level policy language, which is used by OPA. And when we say declarative, it's it's kind of like SQL you, that you you rather rather than saying exactly how something should be done, you just specify what you want done. Uh, and a policy is pretty much just a, a set of rules, and any rule can can return. Uh, a decision. So a decision could be true or false, or it could be a string, it could be a list, uh, or it could be any uh, nested object or, or so. So, so it's, it's really just JSON again. And Rego uh, offers uh, 140, or I think it's almost 150 uh, built-in functions dealing with things that are, that you'll commonly want to deal with in policies such as JSON web tokens, date and time, uh, IP address ranges, math, etc., and so on. And uh, Rego and OPA ships with a, a unit test framework. So, uh, as as you saw in the in the previous talk, like the importance of of testing. Uh, that's that's also one of the main benefits of kind of extracting policy from out of your applications that you can test your policy in isolation and you can deploy your policy uh, 
separately from from uh, your application code so you can kind of have uh, it can kind of have its own uh, life cycle it's a well documented uh, language and it's a well doc documented technology and uh, there's also the OPA playground or the Rego playground where you can try things out and that's so uh, uh, what, what we're gonna uh, see in uh, just one minute but one thing we should mention here before uh, we we do that is normally the policy in, in themselves they they are useful but they need data for in order to to make these decisions they need to know like who is the user what endpoint are we trying to are you trying to reach what operation are you trying to do so there are a number of ways uh, we can provide that to to opa and uh, the most common one is probably just as, as part of the query. So when you ask OPA, you also provide some data. So you say, I am uh, an admin. Am I allowed to, to reach this endpoint? But if, if you need more data or you, or you need uh, data in other forms, you can also like push data into OPA uh, through the OPA REST API. You can also uh, provide OPA uh, data as in form of bundles, uh, which OPA goes and fetch and fetches. Mm -hmm. And as the last one, there's also uh, an HTTP client that you can use from, from inside of your policy. So if you really need to go, go out and fetch some data at policy evaluation time, that is also an option. And with that, I'm gonna hop over here to the Rego playground where we can uh, look at you know, what, what policy offering uh, entails. So to the left here, we have the policy window uh, and to the, to the right, we have some data. So, so this, would, this is meant to simulate maybe a simple REST service, a microservice or so, where the service says some user here is trying to access this path, the, the user's path and the method is, is get. And the way we'd, the way, what the service then would expect is for us to say that, yes, this is allowed or this is not allowed. And uh, we could, if we wanted to, we might also want to uh, respond back with a reason. If we deny someone, we might wanna say, no, you can't, uh, you can't access this endpoint because you don't have uh, the role of a doctor or whatever, uh, whatever is the requirement. So uh, again, an, a policy is just a number of rules. So to start with, I'm gonna add one rule and uh, the kind of anatomy of a rule looks like this. The rule has a name and it has a body. And first of all, the name has no real meaning to OPA. We normally say things like allow, deny, violation, and so on and so forth. But to OPA, they're all just words. So, so these are just names uh, that have meaning to us. Uh, and the way these rules work is that if all uh, the conditions inside of the body are true, then we say that the rule is true. So if I just say something super simple, like, I say that, yeah, this is true, and I evaluate this. I'm gonna see that the output when OPA decide here is that the allow rule is true. And if I add another condition here where I say uh, false, we're gonna see that uh, the allow rule, rule is no longer true. In fact, it's no longer nothing because in OPA, if, if something is not true, it's just undefined. At least that's the default. So if we want to change that, we might we might want to do something like this. We might want to say that by default, allow is equal to false. That seems like a pretty good uh, default for for any like uh, security policy, doesn't it? So we can say that that if we evaluate this again, we can see that now uh, allow is false, even though these conditions are are not true because that's kind of the fallback condition. And if we uh, have that removed, you can see that allow is now true. So now, so now at least know that no matter what, we're going to get some decision. It's going to be something in the output, which is good, of course, if we want to uh, parse that response in, in our client. 
So of course, uh, this, this is kind of a, a silly example. So let's, let's actually do something useful here. You can see here that we have some data as part of the input. So, so let's use that. So we might wanna say here that uh, the user's endpoint, that's kind of a public end, endpoint. So anyone should be able to, to, to read that. So we, we say uh, if input path uh, is equal to users or, or rather, let's say, uh, yeah, let's start with that. And the input method is equal to get. So again, if both of these conditions are true, then the rule is considered to be true. So if we change something here now, or if we evaluate that, yeah, that's still true. If we change something now in the input, so we try and put something in the users, you see that uh, the rule is no longer true. So, so that's kind of super basic, uh, the basics of, of, of how, how Rego rules work. Let's change this back here. Uh, and, and of course, this is just one rule. We, we're probably going to have like hundreds of endpoints or at least uh, a dozens of endpoints and, and maybe several operations. So the way we could do here, we could create uh, new rules and we can aggregate them into like a, a single one. Another thing we could do is just, uh, we could work with what we call incremental rules. Uh, and, and these are kind of forms. So what we do here is just we create another rule with the same name. And the way things work here, like I said here, that if all the rules in the body uh, are true, then the rule is gonna be true. But here outside of uh, the bodies, if one of the rules uh, are true, then the rule is true. So it's kind of and inside of the rules and or outside of it. Uh, so if we say here now, for example, and let's do something a bit more exciting, we could say that there's also a user here, part of the input. So, sorry. Names, letters, and there's an email. Uh, let's just say. Okay, so, so what we're gonna say here that's, is that any user should be able to modify their own data. So if there's a name here, like Anders, so this is obviously, this would be like slash, so we'd, we'd assume that the client have, have did this for us, but we could do that in OPA as well if we wanted to. So uh, if we have the name of the user as the second uh, path component and the method then is put, we wanna allow this. If the name here is equal to the name of the user. So any user can modify their own, uh, their own data. That seems reasonable. So we're gonna say if the input path is equal to users uh, and the next component here is equal to the user name. The input method is equal to put. You can see that, uh, we can see, are we allowed to do that? Yes, we are allowed to do that since those uh, match. And if we change that to, I don't know, Jane, we try and evaluate, we can see that, no, we're no longer. So, and, and again, if we do just a get request, here we can see that's no longer, that's no, that's not allowed either, but that's kind of, that can, that's, it's kind of a bug here maybe in our, uh, in our policy, because we, our intention here was just that anyone can view uh, users, they might not modify them. But so what, what we could really do here, if we say like just, if the first path component is equal to, to users, then we should be allowed. Okay, so that's a policy offering in Rego in, I don't know, five minutes. And, and, and for now, we didn't even use any of these uh, kind of built-ins, uh, built-in functions, but we kind of only used very, uh, the very like primitives of Rego. Uh, it's still in only 30 lines, we managed to, to actually offer uh, a pretty useful uh, all by basic policy. So that's Rego. Okay, so hopping back here, uh, 
And just since this is a CNCF uh, meetup, uh, a topic which is, is always interesting is, is of course Kubernetes and how and how does OPA gonna fit in there? So so to answer that question, uh, first a brief look at the Kubernetes API and and how that works. So the way it basically works when you say kubectl apply and you and you try and deploy a new resource. What you're really trying to do there is you're trying to save that to Kubernetes database, which is of course etcd. But in order to do that, it needs that request needs to pass uh, a series of modules: the authentication module, the authorization module, and the admission controllers. And these modules are chainable, so there could be any number of authenticators, authorizers, or admission controllers uh, as on, on the way to Etcd. And of course, uh, Kubernetes ships with uh, uh, quite a few of these modules. Some of them are uh, more used and, and more commonly seen than others. Uh, like the RBAC module, I guess, which pretty much anyone uses. But for, from an OPA perspective, what's really interesting is uh, is the webhook module. So in, in any of these modules, you can say, instead of consulting one of these built-ins, I'd rather send a request, an HTTP request to some remote endpoint with, uh, with, with this uh, request, with, with these uh, resources that you're trying to persist. Uh, I'd rather send that to a remote endpoint and see what, what that has to say about it. So that sounds kind of familiar, right? That's kind of webhook model, HTTP and JSON body, right? That is exactly how OPA operates. So we don't really do authentication, leave that to others, but for, for all these other modules, OPA is a perfect candidate. And what we're gonna just uh, look a bit deeper into now is the validating admission controller. Uh, OPA is a great fit for both uh, authorizers and mutating admission controllers. But the validating admission controller is by far the, the most popular module to extend. So that's why we, why we take a look at that today. What the validating admission controller really does, it allows us to build policy-based guardrails around our clusters. So we can, we can basically state a number of rules which should be enforced in our clusters as, as uh, cluster administrators or, or as just developers. And, and some of these pretty common enforcements include forcing uh, or enforcing a, a specific Docker registry, an internal company registry, and other image constraints, like you can't use the latest tag, you can't use any version below this or that, and so on. Very common, you'll also, you'll also find uh, rules pertaining to labels. So you need, in order to deploy this uh, service, it needs to be marked with the name of your team. So we know who, who to call when things go bad. It could be a call center, it could be anything like that. Another pretty common uh, case is for to verify like uh, host or path uniqueness for ingress controllers. Uh, and that's a bit more advanced since then you also need to know the current state of your, of your cluster. You can't just check the, the kind of incoming resource. You also need to check what's already out there just to verify that uh, you don't deploy a new application and it kind of takes over on a path already owned by somebody else or some other app. You could also enforce uh, TLS amongst your services, deny uh, insecure attributes like the host path volume mount, uh, and you can set limits on resource allocation and pod security policies or really anything. If there's any, any kind of rule where, where you think this would make sense to standardize upon in our organization or in our team, the validating admission controller, whether you use OPA or not, is, 
is there for you. And it's, it's one of those really, really, I'd say still underused uh, tools, but it's one of the, one of the best, uh, I'd say for Kubernetes from, from both from a security and a compliance standpoint. So uh, just to kind of reiterate here on Rego, you learned the basics here uh, just, just a, a couple of minutes ago. So, so what would it look like then? Well, it, as you can see, the basics are all the same here. We have JSON in the input. The input looks a bit different from, from what we saw in, in, the, in my example, but it's still just, it's just JSON. So we have a, a pod a bit about to be admitted here. And uh, if we check the policy in the middle, it's a very simple policy. It's a deny style policy. And this one returns a, a set of messages. Uh, so, so, so we can kind of respond to the, to the uh, user or, or admin why the, the resource was denied. And we can see here that there's only one, uh, one single uh, requirement here. And we check that since, oh, so, so there's not an input request object, metadata labels cost center. So there's not a cost center provided. If there's not a cost center provided, then we kind of move on to the next line, which is just returning that message that every resource must have a cost center. So the response back from our OPA is gonna be a deny. Every resource must have a cost center label. So this, that's what you're gonna see when you do kubectl apply. And then, of course, you can just go back to your resource, uh, add a label for cost center, and then redeploy, and everything will, will be fine. So that's kind of how we can enforce these policies uh, across our clusters. So uh, worth mentioning, of course, is that running OPA and Rego uh, for a single service, a single deployment, or a couple of them, it kind of works to just have uh, just you just push your policy to a config map or whatever. But once you kind of start to roll out OPA as a sidecar for hundreds or thousands of microservices, you might need uh, better tooling for that. And that's where uh, OPA's management APIs come in. Uh, and, and what they what they what they do is they offer a way to configure OPA to to kind of reach out to remote endpoints in order to obtain policy, to log decisions. That's another huge thing for like when you start to extract uh, policy from your application logic, because now all of a sudden you you also have a golden opportunity to actually see what's going on in terms of decision. These decisions no longer drown out in, in, in the noise. You have a status API for just kind of reporting status back to a, a, a management server. And then there's a discovery API for uh, periodically fetching configuration. Okay, so uh, where do you start then? If you, if you think this sounds like, a, like it would be something for you, I suggest like start small. There's uh, really there's really no reason not to. Uh, OPA is, uh, and maybe just start with uh, the playground. Then in in one tab, and maybe the docs in another. And try try it out. Maybe try these, try a couple of big uh, built-ins, and just uh, learn as you go. And then then start to look into the apps like close to you, those that you have experience with working and, and uh, try and identify which policies you, you have there already, because it's not like you can choose whether to work with policy or not. You always have policy, just whether you do it in uh, a nice way or not. And uh, once you, once you've uh, identified some, uh, uh, policy, you can start to delegate some of that to OPA. And again, you don't need to rewrite your whole app in a single <laughs> sitting. You can, you can start with maybe one endpoint, one operation or one role or, or whatever. Just start small and then, and then kind of deploy and build experience from that. And after that, you can start to consider these kind of management uh, 
opportunities or management capabilities, such as decision logging, how to serve, how to share, have like shared policy across hundreds of, of, uh, of pods or applications. And a couple of uh, free resources from, from Styra, it's the Styra Academy, which is a, a great learning resource, which is absolutely free. There's the Styra DAS, which offers many of these uh, management capabilities once you've uh, kind of grown beyond the, the basics. And there's the OPA Slack, if you, and then that's uh, a fantastic community of, I think we're almost 5,000 people now. So, and, and growing every day. So uh, yeah, that's OPA. And uh, with that, I say, thank you. So the first question is, uh, as a pod security policy perspective, how, uh, how can we use OPA on cluster level instead of build in communities pod security policies? I mean, without deploying a sidecar, do you recommend gatekeeper project? Yeah, sure. So uh, yeah, so so what Gatekeeper is is basically doing this. Uh, what, what we what we uh, looked at in terms of admission control, you can either just deploy like OPA, the the vanilla version, and have it just. So what what Gatekeeper does, it offers uh, some convenience on top of that. So you can you push your policies as. Um, as Kubernetes objects, for example. So you can as like custom resource definitions. So you can work with policy and so in, in, in ways that are familiar to many like uh, Kubernetes admins. So, so yeah, I, I can definitely recommend trying it out. And it's a, it's a great replacement for uh, pod security policies. But I think, uh, but I also think like just, just trying, trying out OPA like the regular vanilla OPA is is probably I, at least I think it's it's a better way of learning because then you really then you really kind of confronted with okay this is the JSON object coming in and this is the JSON object coming out it doesn't really hide anything from from you so it's kind of OPA the the hard way if you if you'd like. Thank you, Andres. Uh, we have uh, two more questions. Uh, first is does Styra provide professional support if needed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, that that we do. And and then the follow up question was, <laughs> how many support hours do we have to buy to get uh, such a t shirt? <laughs> that we can we can certainly uh, uh, send send you a t shirt, RB. So just just reach out to Anders at Styra uh, after, and I'll, I'll make sure you get a t-shirt, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so Styra, we provide support for OPA, and uh, we also provide uh, a management component for, for OPA. So 